The theme of the night is probably going to be golden child and scapegoat dynamics just because of the Percy and Talia dynamics within these chapters. And um, I mean, we've already talked on that a bit because of last um, last time we read where Talia gets to drive the sun chariot. And um, yeah, it just seems like automatically people are deferring to her. So. Um, we see that even more so coming up. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's basically what these chapters were with like, just seeing that happen in real time and just being like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I just, I made a note of this, but um, Apollo still, like the only thing he's really said to Percy is probably right here in the beginning of chapter five, where he says, watch out for those prophecies. Like literally doesn't pay any attention to him and then just leaves with watch out for those prophecies. Like that is so messed up. Yeah, especially cause at this point also, Apollo knows about the part of the prophecy that Percy doesn't. Mm -hmm. um so it's like fuck you bro <laughs> that the only thing you say to him is like hey watch out for that prophecy that says you're going to be stabbed to death yeah like already arguing about whether we should just kill you now <laughs> like you could have just said nothing this is also apollo this is why in a few years time when he shows up for your help he's like get away from me <laughs> Like, maybe if you would have been nicer to him the entire time, he wouldn't have yelled, what, <laughs> in your face when you show up and look for help. <laughs> yeah. Just... I mean, it's worth noting, though, that he says that to Percy, even though he's been nicer to Talia. So, like, he full on knows at this point that even though technically she can still be the prophecy kid, she's not the prophecy kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's so. weird, like... That alone is also like a weird golden child scapegoat thing of like, I know that golden child isn't like strong enough to handle like the brunt of everything, but I know you are. I'm still yeah. going to ignore you though and make it as hard as humanly possible for you to do this shit. But also I just know that this is also true at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And like, Apollo snubs him multiple times in these chapters. It doesn't happen right away, but when Percy eventually goes to the Oracle, theoretically, that is him asking for Apollo's help in a way, in a roundabout way. And so um, he gets snubbed by him twice with like, hey, can I just know what's going on right now? <laughs> that might be helpful. Like, can somebody just yeah. tell me what's going on? Especially because that part, um, I thought that that part and the part when he's in his cabin, mm -hmm. he's like, my dad literally bought, built a fountain here to try to guilt me into talking to him some more. Um, and he's like going through the people he could talk to and he talks to the best person, which yeah. makes me so happy. But it's also just like a thing of like him going through this stuff just shows how he doesn't really have anybody like that he can talk to outside of like Annabeth and Grover and like that's it because like in this situation he's like well Chiron's probably not going to tell me the truth because he actually cares about me yeah and nobody else is going to give me the answer so I'm just going to go and talk to this terrifying oracle figure that I still have nightmares about <laughs> because that's the only option I have because nobody else will actually tell me anything <laughs> yeah um let's see and so yeah he's very alone at camp not just because he's not quite getting along with the people that he came with but also because um there's just like nobody there he's saying basically because it's winter it's only the year rounders which are people who don't have families or like it would be too dangerous like because monsters just really like them um mm -hmm. so it's a very very small group of people even if he were to try to like get out there and make a new friend and one part of that that i think is interesting is the whole thing that clarice isn't there mm -hmm. and that she's off on a secret mission yeah i think i know what that is but um it's also when i thought about that like with the eventual like you know um capture the flag fight mm -hmm. i thought that like 
if she was there, that probably wouldn't have happened the same way. Yeah. Um, but because she's not there, it like happens that particular <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah, you probably would have seen her butt heads with Talia because like just two strong <laughs> women. I, yeah. <laughs> like, oh my God. No, oh my God. That would never have worked. No, no, there's no way that Clarice would have been like, yeah, sure. Like totally like you just like came back and i get that i she might know of you and all that but like yeah totally we're just gonna completely do your plan and ignore everybody else that's no <laughs> she yeah. she would have like been very angry about that just on like principle well and i i do want to jump ahead to talk about capture the flag a bit because some of the observations that percy makes around camp i feel mm -hmm. like we could have incorporated into the plan and it would have worked so like um with capture the flag chiron says that it's tradition for the campers and the hunters anytime the hunters come and stay to have capture the flag against each other and so um talia and percy are tasked with telling everybody else and um they both fight over who's going to be captain and they're like oh we'll co-captain it but on the day of capture the flag talia takes over and basically like steamrolls a plan mm -hmm. um but so Percy makes a lot of observations as he's going through camp. Number one is he sees the Stoll brothers trying to break into the camp store. Um, why, why did we not send the sneaky thief Hermes kids after the flag? You know, they clearly have that, those skills and they were left back at the defense, which like, that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> I have to imagine Hermes kids are quite small, like build wise. And so, um, yeah, it just, it does not make sense. They're not built for defense. They're built to like stealth their way to the flag and then trick their way back to camp. Even like, I guess Charlie makes a little bit more sense to be defense. Kind of, I guess, just because he's an Hephaestus kid. And so they like make all of this stuff. Yeah. I mean, he's one of the older ones at camp at this point, but it's all, even that is like, why, why even him, like out of everybody to be defense, shouldn't it be like a couple like Aries kids who are yeah. really, who like d literally defend camp, like d defended camp last summer when people were trying to kill them. Like those kids would be the ones that would be the best suited for that um but it's the whole that whole the whole thing about thalia's plan that i that it that i think is like kind of funny if it wasn't also infuriating because of how it all ends between her and percy is that um the plan itself isn't necessarily bad but it fails because she wanted to do a plan that made her like the star of everything and made sure that he had nothing to do with any of it like if she would have just let him actually be like a part of everything then then it probably would have succeeded and every and they would have actually beat them for the first time in like 56 times or whatever uh chiron says when they lose again um yeah. but because she she was like no i have to be i have to be the star it doesn't work out and it's just one of those things if you if you would just like work with him everything would be fine um, and he tries, but she's just like, no. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, let's see, but I wanted to note that because I, I definitely highlighted that as I was going, I was like, those kids should have been sent on the team that was actually going or at, even, at least the diversion team, like the Stoll brothers should have at least been on the diversion team. Cause like, then they could have. I don't know, just like really caused a huge diversion that led a bunch of hunters that way. And that is like, the Stolf brothers are so funny like that. Like, I hope that they cast them on the TV show just because they're like, they don't even necessarily have to like name them as them, but just have them be there in the, they're just funny. Like during like the, the thing that most people bring up is during like the very last book, during the huge gigantic battle that takes over all of New York City, they're in the middle of this do or die battle and they're trying to break in. <laughs> they're trying to break into like convenience stores and steal shit because they can, because everyone who's mortal is like asleep and they're just like, 
and somebody asked them, I think, like, why are you doing that? And they're like, why, why not? <laughs> so that's just how they are. So yeah, oh, they're man. like walking chaos. <laughs> and so you might as if you wanted to create chaos, they're the best people ever to ask to create something for you. Wouldn't it even be hard for them? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. So then we have, um, let's see. So Chiron and Mr. D and Percy and Talia have to break the news that Annabeth has been taken by the Manticore. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I definitely got mad along with Percy when Mr. D was pretending not to know Annabeth's name. Yeah, that like she's been there for so long that it's like you absolutely know who she is. So like, why are you pretending like you don't? Um, just that whole interaction with Dionysus reminded me about why when I read these books, I did not like him at all. Yeah. Um, because when I was watching the show, I was like, why did I hate you so much? And I was like, oh yeah, this is why. Because mm -hmm. he has the most just like mean reaction you can really have to a kid being taken of like, oh, we're not gonna like try to save her because she's probably already dead. And even if she's not already dead, she's going to have to figure it out on her own. It's like, you're a literal god. This camp is here to, like, train us for situations like this. And now that something has, like, come up where she's, like, done so much for all the people here. And now that she needs a little bit of help, you're just like, no. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I'm not even going to pretend like, or at least pretend like you care. <laughs> Yeah, so Percy snaps. He snaps at, at Dionysus bad, and it was definitely deserved. Like, the because he goes from thinking, like, this is supposed to be a punishment for him. Why the hell are we the ones actually being punished? To saying that to his face. And um, the way he said it, I thought it was really pointed. Um, let's see. This is your civilization, too. Maybe you could try helping out a little. And Dionysus is, like, closer to the demigods than he likes to believe. The only reason he is fully divine is because his daddy sewed him into his thigh. His mom was immortal. She wasn't, like, any sort of divine creature. So, um, yeah, like, it's just really weird birth circumstances that made him a full-on immortal. And so he's a lot closer to the demigods than he likes to pretend he is. Yeah, and I know some people talk about Dionysus, like, oh, maybe part of the reason why he's so horrible to the demigods is because he used to be one, and he, like, doesn't like being reminded of that, but it's also, like, a thing of, like, you need to, like, get your shit together, <laughs> because you're the one who's in charge of this shit, and this kid is missing and might be dead is in a very bad situation regardless of what's going on mm -hmm. and you can't even like pretend like it, the the words that percy says is exactly correct of like could you try to care like you why are we being punished like mm -hmm. by because of you it um it just reminds me so much of the shit i used to say to my dad of like it's not my fucking fault your dad was an asshole but you're like ruining my life because of your dad i don't care about your daddy like and that's very much like that like there's only so many times you can listen to somebody and be aware that they're making your life harder because of nothing that you've done before you finally just like snap and are like can you like stop doing this because I'm tired of being the one to have to take all of the brunt of everything that has nothing to do with me. Like, it's not my fault that you got caught and you can't drink alcohol for a hundred years. Yeah. Like, Jesus Christ. Um, yeah. I, I, I appreciated that a lot. And I especially liked that, um, how, um, who is it? Like Nico, I think just like comes in mm -hmm. and just like, stops it because Dionysus isn't going to kill Percy in front of a 12, a 10 year old child. Yeah. <laughs> so at least he has, he has some sort of limits there that he's not willing to murder somebody in front of like a fourth grader. So that's at least something that he won't do. But I like that just because I really didn't want to read 
Percy having to like apologize when he was in no way sorry and shouldn't be sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm glad that he got away, that Rick made up a scenario that got him to leave that situation without having to apologize to a horrible person. <laughs> yeah. So, that was a plus. <laughs> Yeah, and it's so funny too because I like Dionysus is so confused by the interaction with Nico that I feel like that's <laughs> why it doesn't happen. Because like I don't know whether I would be insulted or not with what he says with the mytho magic thing. It's like, oh, everyone says that you're the worst, but I like your powers. <laughs> like, am I supposed to be like what am I supposed to feel right now? That's what I would definitely think. Yeah, this little 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 kid is like you kind of suck a lot in my game, but you don't seem that bad. And it's just like, what do I even say to something like that? <laughs> um, yeah. The part of the interaction that I thought was really interesting, though, was, of course, afterwards when Thalia is like saying to him, like, oh, you should have, um, like, how many, um, how many, like, bad people do you want mad at you, basically? Like, mm -hmm. oh, you're already. Aries is already mad at you. Do you want to add somebody else? Yeah. And when that's like the golden child stuff that I think of, because please explain to me what he did to make Aries mad at him. Like, what could he have done differently for Aries to not hate him? Should he have just died? Like on on the on the beach? Like, it's not his fault that Aries is stupid enough to fight a child of Poseidon on a beach <laughs> like that's not his problem but i'm like sitting here thinking like the reason why aries hates him is because he tried to overthrow olympus and percy figured it out and stopped him should he be upset about that it should should he have like tried to placate like the out of control god who was trying to overthrow olympus just to like fuck around with his brothers to have him not be like a to not be an enemy or something of his like do you even know what you're saying right now <laughs> and, but it's like that that's like the whole golden child thing where they like say stuff like that to you when you're the scapegoated one and you're just sitting there like like what percy does you don't say anything back because it's like there's no point in me saying this because at least how it went in my head i'm like that is such a stupid statement that i'm not even gonna like qualify trying to explain why i didn't why i have this person as like an enemy because it's so obvious to me that why waste like my breath <laughs> when this yeah. person is being like very ridiculous like because i don't know how out of the airy situation and about that that whole situation with dionysus how he could be like in the wrong or or anything but it is like the whole thing that Thalia is like the more golden child person she would be like have that like knee-jerk reaction of trying to defend the gods even yeah. even though I don't think she even is thinking about really what she's even saying it's just like she's just saying it because she it's she just knows she that she's supposed to and I don't even think She's gotten far enough to think about like why am why am I defending them right now though? Yeah. Uh, and it's I think that stuff is especially interesting because that conversation is her being like, oh, the happiest time in my life was when I was homeless on the run with Luke. Um, but then she's also defending the gods that forced her life to be that way. And so it's like you don't even you can't even see like the hypocrisy of of what's happening to you right now because you just haven't taken the time to think about it. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the reason that some of us golden children can stay golden is because we master the fawn response. Like, mm -hmm. it's um, when you have the fawn response, sometimes you get so good at it, it's like, I, I can definitely defuse the problem with this response if I just like say these things to this person. And so I feel like, maybe she mastered that with the gods early on and um so for her it's more just like i don't think she even registers at all these thoughts that percy is having and that he's rightfully having i think this is just my own like uh perception i guess of like golden child stuff as the other role but 
I think a lot of it is this general idea that if they like play nice almost or like try to make the powerful person happy with them that they will somehow get like rewards for being connected to that powerful person mm -hmm. and so for her she thinks that like defending the gods to percy is a better move because she wants to like align herself more with the gods than like him and like percy's whole thing is he doesn't care about the gods he just cares about the demigod kids which is why he's always successful in ways that other people aren't but I think that's the thing that she's doing that a lot of golden children or people just in that sort of role want. Like you see that all the time in life when people try to like appeal to like authority instead of appealing to like the regular person that's actually in front of you because they think that that authority figure will like somehow give them more power or something. Um, it usually doesn't end up that way. <laughs> or like the power that you get is like kind of you know, fleeting, or it's also a thing of like, what do I actually, what did I do to actually get this? Is it really worth it sort of yeah. stuff? But I, I think that's what that is, because it's just, that conversation is really interesting, because she's giving him a hard time about the gods, then is like apologizing to him for being a raging bitch to him so far. And yeah. like, acknowledges that she's being horrible, to, she has been horrible to him for no reason. Um, and is like trying to apologize and is like, hey, you can like, we can co-captain um, mm -hmm. capture the flag. And, and, um, and even the thing that I thought was like funny in like an ironic way about that conversation was that she's telling, she tells him about her mom, like her, her biological mom that she died from basically alcoholism in the years that she was gone. Um, and I thought that it was funny that because Percy is a very like empathetic, understanding person, that he was like, oh, that's why you were afraid when you were trying to drive the sun chariot. You were triggered, you were having a trauma response and you couldn't drive a car because your mom died in a car accident. And that is 100% not why that happened. She was just afraid of heights. <laughs> but yeah. he's like a very empathetic person so he's like oh that's why you were just really scared i totally understand why you're that scared and she's just like yeah that's why i did that <laughs> yeah yeah it's like i i can see like where she's having that awakening as a golden child a little bit because of percy but she's not quite there yet and so she's doing this give and take with him um like, yeah when I read that scene, I had like vivid, like flashbacks to my own life with my own sister where it, so like the, this isn't the situ exact situation that Thalia and Percy are in, but this is kind of, is a good example of what an actual trauma bond is when people actually do this in like real life. Like this could have turned into something like that if Thalia, you know, stayed around, but she didn't. But just the whole process of she's really horrible to Percy for, and he doesn't know why. And then she, during this scene, she apologizes to him and tries to like make peace with him and tries to be like, hey, we can do this thing together and everything will be fine. And even tr is like saying like, yeah, everything is like that kind of like helplessness of like, yeah, everything sucks and I don't really care what happens kind of thing is it's um, weird, but like my sister was definitely the one that is the more pessimistic one out of us. And I don't know how that happens that the golden child is like the pessimistic one and the scapegoat is usually the more like optimistic, like still has faith and hope in people. It should be the other way around. <laughs> like when you think about what we experience, but it's usually not like that generally with people who play those roles in different places and families and situations. And so you see them doing that. And then when I was reading that, I'm like, this is nice, but I know this is going to go to shit at some point because that's what always happens is yeah. they apologize and be nice to you. And so you get like your hopes up thinking that they're going to stay nice to you. And I was like feeling myself doing that. And then I was like, stop it. <laughs> like that doesn't work in your own life. It's not going to work in this fictional book either. And yeah, then I, then we got to like the capture the flag fight and right from the very beginning, 
things started like going badly again. And I was like, yeah, I, I got it. Like, and it's that whole thing of they're, they can like try to make peace with you, but not enough in any like real way, I guess. Like they're not willing to like give up anything that they, they perceive that they have to actually share it with you. Yeah. After some time, you kind of figure that out, but it takes a really long time. And so it was really interesting reading them doing that cycle um, just in this one chapter. And I don't even remember what happens in the rest of the book. I, a friend of mine told me that in the chapters we're going to read for next week, Thalia is disgusting <laughs> to Percy. Like he, she won't even talk to him. Yeah. Like he's like telling Grover, like Grover, can you tell Percy? And, he, and he's standing right next to her. <laughs> And she won't, she won't even talk to him because she, because she's mad about capture the flag. Yeah. <laughs> just like, oh my fucking God, I totally blocked that out. I totally understand why my brain blocked that out. Um, but yeah, yeah. They haven't even like left for the quest yet. I already know things happen when they're on the quest together. Um, so that should be interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, so with, I think the reason why golden children tend to be a little bit more pessimistic than scapegoats is because when we go out into the real world, we're no longer in our bubble and it's scary and like people don't like us as much as we're used to and it's totally foreign. You guys go out into the real world and because you experience so much shit at home, you're just like, wow, this is actually kind of nice not being at home. <laughs> I'm laughing because that's true. And I, I also think it's like a thing of, this is just how I like think about this stuff. Like if I was around somebody that I knew was hurting other people that I was around all the time and I was like choosing to help like them do that instead of helping the person that was being hurt, I feel like you have to almost just have this like belief that the world is a horrible place and people are generally bad and that nobody will do the right thing and that kind of stuff in order to justify to like yourself just to yourself like in your own head to make those sort of decisions you have to be like oh that person doesn't really like me or they don't really care about me and i think that in general about like people who bully other people just overall is i think you have to think those things to justify doing what you do because there's no way that anyone would be able to do that stuff except for like the super, super bad abusive people, obviously, um, who would, cause usually people, if you're, you're aware that the other person is like a nice person and they haven't done anything wrong to you, it's harder for people to do that stuff to them. And so I think that's part of it too, is they just have to kind of convince themselves of like, oh, the world is horrible. Why bother like trying to act like anyone's a nice person because I know that they're not um, sort of feeling. I think that's, I think it's both of them like mixed together most likely but yeah. it is because i'm sure that you like you would know like that they have you guys have like moments of um questioning what you're doing and those sort of things are the things that like probably keep people going when they have those moments of questioning and stuff i it's hard because you know like i don't i don't think that my type of golden child like lifestyle ever enabled over abuse like emotional abuse yes i will i will like say there was a lot of more emotional abuse in my household than there anything else but like um what i find is that you're given this intrinsic like human have humans have different degrees of value system somehow through it no matter how it's done in your family and, you know, mine had touches of colorism and sexism. Um, it had touches of like ableism when you find out later as an adult, my brother gets diagnosed as autistic. And like, it, it was more just like, I had more social value, I guess, than my brother because I looked better than him. I was lighter skinned, I was a girl. I. Um, I was more pleasant to be around. Um, I don't know. I can hold conversations better and all of those things, like not necessarily true, even like now as adults. So, um, I think 
that weird value system. And then also we do have to acknowledge that they're in a very extreme example where like actually being in favor of whoever the adult or parent figure is actually it like helps a lot. Um, in real life, I can't say that being my mom's favorite helped outside of her household. You know, it didn't help more than I had. I got away with doing less chores. I got away with more shit. But like, what is that in the real world? You know, like that, that value doesn't really mean anything else. We didn't have money. It's not like, you know, I'm getting a trust fund or something, mm -hmm. <laughs> anything like that. So, um, yeah, it's it's weird because like you can justify hers a little bit more than you can in the real life example, but I don't know. I don't know. It is hard. Like I don't I'm thinking about my own, of course. Mine was crazy. But I will say that at least with mine, that my sister did get things closer to the situation. Um, just purely the fact that she didn't experience anything that I did. Um, and she was able to, like, have an actual, like, childhood. <laughs> yeah. She actually had one of those and talks about, like, childhood memories and stuff that I don't remember at all. Or, um, or just, like, had one. Like, she was able to be more of, like, a kid for a lot longer than I was. Okay. And it didn't know what was going on, like just like little, little, even like little things. Like I remember when she was like 12 or 13 or something, that was when my parents had gotten divorced and they had filed for bankruptcy. Um, mm -hmm. they, they didn't have, we were so poor, especially then, but we were oh also so poor. Like I can remember being worried about money when I was like seven years old. I don't know why I knew, I, I, well, I know why I knew that because my dad would talk to me about stuff like that, even if I don't remember it actually happening. But there's no other reason why I would know things like that if he didn't t tell me stuff like that. Um, but when she was like 12 or 13, I, one of those years, it was like my mom's birthday, you know, she's a Leo like, like you. So her birthday is the end of July. And um, the summer is always tight with money because my mom's a teacher. And so they get like one paycheck at the beginning of the summer that's supposed to last for the entire summer, but it never it never does. Are you kidding? <laughs> like that's not, that's, it's never enough money to actually take care of everything you need. And so we didn't, she didn't, we didn't have money to like go out to eat, um, to like a nice restaurant. And, um, so my mom was like, oh, we can just go to like Boston market or something and just like pick up some food that still nicer food than we usually would eat, but not like super expensive. And my sister threw like an epic, epic, tantrum like full-on tantrum like she was a little kid again was like screaming like literally screaming in the car screaming in the restaurant she literally ran got out of the car and started running down the street like away from where we were having this gigantic like epic tantrum because she was mad that we weren't going to like a nice restaurant and she was like she in her like still childlike mind she was thinking like we should go to a nice restaurant for mom's birthday it's why are all of you okay with not going there and it's like because the rest of us knew we were fucking poor like mm -hmm. we were poor we have no money my my mom was like taking out loans from the grocery store she worked at to buy our groceries that she would take that they would take out of her paycheck every week we had nothing and everyone else there knew that we had nothing but she was still somehow able to like be naive of that fact and was just like, she brought this memory up like on Christmas last year, just like as like a funny example of her being like a dramatic kid. And like still now, still to this day, she does not understand what was actually going on. And she like, she was saying like, oh, we never would go out to eat when we were younger. Why did we do that? And then finally I just told her because we were fucking poor we had no money mom and dad had no money to take us out to eat that's why we never went at, out to eat ever <laughs> and we would just eat fast food but even stuff like that she like just doesn't she just doesn't get it and it's such a different way to like grow up where in a weird roundabout way like it's, it's not that weird honestly when you think about it is that like she was able to like 
get into the college she wanted to go to that I didn't get into when we graduated high school. She got her bachelor's degree. She's been at the same job for like nine years. And like my job experience has been insane. <laughs> like I never graduated from a four year degree. It took me four years to get an associate's degree. And I've changed my career like four different times, um, three different times at least since in like the last like five or six years or so. And so just with that alone, like her actually being able to have like a childhood. Yeah. That she got to like get those things when she left the house. So she was able to like handle life a lot easier and just live life in society a lot better. She still obviously experienced some bad stuff too. I'm not saying that she didn't, but in the same way that like Thalia experienced some bad stuff too, obviously when she was, when she's in this world, but she also overall has an easier time kind of engaging in the world and being successful in it than Percy like ever will. <laughs> like, yeah. To this day, he like, he's still having to like get letters of recommendation to go to college, <laughs> like where the books are coming out right now. And so he still has to constantly prove himself. He's always going to have to do that because he gives the god shit <laughs> um in the way that she she doesn't give them that shit and so she gets like a pass from for, from a lot of those experiences yeah well and it really does take learning that the rewards aren't worth like you know being a part of the system anymore to break being a golden child for me that's something i had to do and i don't talk about this a lot with going no contact with my mom because i don't I don't love that it was a factor in why I didn't go no contact sooner, but like babysitting help. She would help buying clothes for William. She would sometimes buy groceries for me. Like a lot of expenses just randomly would get taken care of. Like, oh, you had to go to the dentist. Was there a copayment? Let me pay it. Like, you know, and it, it was no problem, but, um, once I realized that that benefit wasn't worth like keeping up the relationship as it was, that's when I was finally able to say, okay, I need, I need something different so that I can, I can change and grow from this. Mm -hmm. Um, and unfortunately in this fictional scenario, the gods are ever present, their power is ever present. And so there's not really ever going to be an incentive for her to just do the right thing just because Percy does it because he grew up different. And that's the only difference in why he's able to make those choices. Yeah, that's the thing. There's a million reasons why you should love Percy, but um, that's why I love the, it sounds weird to say I love his abusive background, but, <laughs> but I love his abusive background because that's why he so aggressively aligns himself with other demigods and never once in his entire fucking existence, will he ever consider not doing that or like aligning himself with somebody else? Those thoughts would never even enter his mind because when you are abused by an authority figure, you hate all authority figures. And you also know that they're never gonna give you what you actually want. And so like, that's kind of the, the great thing about this general book series is that Percy is the one that aligns himself with the actual demigods, like the actual kids over like the powerful figures, even though the world is constantly trying to get him to talk to the powerful gods instead. And it's why he succeeds. Like everybody fucking worships him, like in the story, like it takes, you know, first five books for it to happen. Um, but like, when he disappears in the first Heroes of Olympus book, Camp Half-Blood is having like a mental breakdown. Like yeah. people are terrified because he's gone and they don't know what to do. And like the, to the point that the new kids don't like him <laughs> because of how much everybody loves him and they talk about him. And literally like, imagine you get to camp and everywhere you go, people are like disappointed to see you because you're not Percy Jackson. You're like, who the fuck is Percy Jackson? Like, and it's like that in their first book, everywhere they go, nobody cares that much about them. And they, they like, like Clarice openly questions whether it was worth it for them to save these other kids. 
because they could have been spending that time trying to go after Percy instead. And Annabeth is like, every demigod matters. But like the entire camp is like, this was a waste of time because that wasn't actually Percy. And so it's like, people like worship him in that world so much because he doesn't align himself with the gods. And so the gods can like never do anything that much to him after that point because all of their children would like actually try to overthrow them. <laughs> If they even tried to like hurt him in like a serious, like a super serious like way, like they already were very angry at Hera in, in that book series or what she does to him. Yeah. But it's it's great to see a book series like this where that like actually pays off because it's not usually in real life. It does pay off like because I don't have nightmares anymore. I don't have insomnia anymore. I don't have like any sort of crippling anxiety to the point that it's like negatively affecting my life. Like I still have some of those things that come up, but it's nowhere near as bad as it used to be um, at all. It's like very, very different than how, it, than how it used to be. And so usually it's like that sort of a thing of like, yeah, okay, I don't fit into society because of what I experienced. So living every day is like difficult and I get triggered sometimes a lot of times because of the things I experienced, but at least I'm like actually know what it's like to be happy. And a lot of the baggage that I carried around for many years is now like way lessened or just gone when I know that they haven't. But in this in this book series, you get to see him like literally like succeed <laughs> and be offered to become a god <laughs> yeah. because it, because he like sticks with his own people instead of, you know, aligning himself with the gods including telling them no when he when they offer him that yeah uh, what was i gonna say oh the the next scene where they go where he goes back to his cabin i think and he sees like the, the fountain, fountain that feels like his dad trying to guilt him into talking to him when he doesn't want to <laughs> yeah yeah and i do love as you said he he calls tyson because he goes through the list he's like yeah i could call my mom but like I'm, I want to talk to Tyson. And so we get a little scene of happy Tyson making swords, although the making swords part turns out not to be happy. And it's like very subtle. Like if, if it was anybody but Tyson, you would get so much more information about what's going on undersea. But like the gist of what we can decipher through Ty Tyson also just being happy to see Percy is that he is in the middle of making a bunch of weapons because they're going to arm the mermaids because titans that used to control seas and rivers are helping to hide the boat and the princess andromeda the, the cruise ship that luke is on and that the cruise ship is headed towards panama canal which I don't remember how that comes back, but I do know that like, so now not only do they have monsters in shrouding them, but they're basically in a physical chokehold, like a very narrow passageway. So I think that somehow I don't, rem I honestly don't remember, but I think that somehow comes into play at the end of this book that they're like trying to get to like the other side of the country. Mm -hmm. um, because I do remember that the end of this book takes place in California. Um, yeah. So I, because I think it might be something like that because I honestly don't remember, but I, I just love the whole scene of him being like, I could talk to my mom, but it's only been like one, it hasn't even been like a full day really since he saw her last. Yeah. And he's, he's also, I'm also aware of like, I'm gonna leave again soon because I'm gonna go after Annabeth. So like telling my mom that I'm fine now seems like almost like unfair yeah. <laughs> to be like, hey, I'm fine, but I'm about to leave again. So I might not be fine again later um, sort of situation. And then him just being like, I don't wanna talk to my dad. And just like the way that he goes around that reminds me of what I would do when like trying to get in for information from about what's going on without having to actually talk to the person because you don't want to so you like find a way or like around it of him being like I don't want to actually just talk to my dad because I don't know what's going on and and he has like misplaced guilt about what's happening right now that he probably feels like something is somehow his fault because that's just how it works. 
And so instead, he's like, I'm going to talk to my brother who loves me unconditionally. <laughs> yeah. And will, won't give me any shit, won't make me feel bad for anything that's happened, won't like blame me for my best friend being, you know, tortured in my place right now or something or other. And will just make me feel good about myself for like three minutes. <laughs> And it is like when I saw Tyson, I was like so happy to see him again because I didn't remember where he showed up again. Um, and it is like so sweet to see him just. I love the the Tyson ways that he explains things. Of mm -hmm. like, oh, we're making like a bazillion swords to stop to try to stop the bad ship. Yeah, and like you get, you, it's one of those things like when you talk to little kids, you can sometimes get more information um than an adult would give you because they don't really fully get what they're even saying like he yeah. gets it but not really um but it was just really sweet and uh I did wish that their conversation could have gone on a little bit longer <laughs> and yeah. he would have gotten in trouble with his boss <laughs> whoever that boss is <laughs> at like working in the forges and stuff and could have talked to Percy a little bit longer because that basically is like Tyson's role in the story going forward is he basically pops up when Percy's feeling like really bad about himself and makes him feel a lot better about himself and is kind of like that break from all of the craziness is just somebody that loves you it is sad that he asked where Annabeth was and he just like lied to him and said that she wasn't there yeah um, because he didn't want to have to tell his like sweet brother that annabeth was kidnapped and was in danger he would have cried for like 30 years <laughs> wow. um so he just like was like i don't want to do that to you so i'm just gonna pretend like that's not happening um it reminds me a lot of like when i see like my one and a half year old niece but it's just nice to hang out with her and it's so innocent that i can like ignore literally everything else that's going on in my life that's going wrong <laughs> Yeah. And it's like that sort of interaction or like when you talk to like kids, like when you would talk to your son, um, mm -hmm. he has problems and stuff. He's getting old enough where he does, but everything is just more simple for them than like the problems that we're dealing with right now. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we do get that, like you said, that conversation cuts off so short. Um, let's see. Uh... I highlighted a bunch during it. So um, I did say the Panama Canals part, part, the old spirits protecting the bad boat. Um, there's nothing big with, I guess it's a, a Gaios. I don't know how you'd say that, but um, yeah. that's just a random Titan that was some sort of river spirit. So not anybody important, um, but yeah, they're headed towards the Panama Canal. Um, I didn't highlight anything during the dinner. Mm -mm. Yeah. The dinner, the dinner, if anything, it just kind of like shows the like loneliness mm -hmm. that Percy feels because Grover is too busy being Artemis's ultimate fanboy <laughs> to like really be paying attention to him. And because Annabeth is gone and also Clarice is gone, he doesn't really have anybody else to talk to. And yeah. it's just the whole thing of like, I have to eat by myself, but also he doesn't have anyone else to talk to anymore right now anyway. And it's just in the like this really weird space at at camp in general. Yeah. I mean, it seems like when he lists off all the people, it seems like there is like an urge to sit with Talia, but like he knows that, you know, he asks at his own table. I really do feel like I'm getting somewhat of why people say they're similar, but it's it's more so that like in the way that all scapegoats and um, and golden children are similar. I mean, we all grow up in the same household under the same circumstances. It's just how we react to it and how that environment reacts to us that's really different. And so I feel like Percy is a lot more perceptive of that. I mean, scapegoats tend to be, you guys tend to get like, oh yeah they experience the same parents and like you probably notice when our, our parents are being shitty to us more than we do sometimes mm -hmm. um but yeah I, it's sad that he can't really reach out to her and he just feels like super alone even nico is like preoccupied with the stole brothers 
Yeah, and that's sort of the thing with like people talk about Percy and Thalia having a rivalry, and I'm like, there is no rivalry here. I think it's like almost like a social experiment that people think that there is. Like Walker Scobell has been interviewed on podcasts where they tell him that he's wrong about Thalia. <laughs> like I watched an interview with him once where he was talking we'll we'll get to like the specifics of it when we go through like the 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 big fight during like capture the flag but he was talking about that and like saying you know what actually did happen that it wasn't like percy trying to like get attention for himself and the hosts on this podcast i was watching were like i'm not sure that's how that actually happened and i was like watching it being like yeah that is how that actually happened what do you mean (laughs) and and so it was just so weird to see like a really popular like podcast that's like interviewed most of like the cast of, and like crew and stuff at this point, like still saying that. And I was like, why do people think that they have a rivalry? Like at this point, Percy would like to talk to her and she keeps telling him no. Like mm-hmm. that's their entire like relationship is, and that's like very, very, very much like the scapegoat like experience is watching this other person like the especially the person in the golden child role and knowing like if i could and that's part of like the thing that's hard to like let go of trying to talk to them and like get them to be your friend at a certain point like percy has things like distracts him so he gets away from like that whole cycle with her um Mm -hmm. really because it's not a good thing to get stuck in but generally that's how it is with scapegoats where we like look at the other person and we're like if i could just get this person to listen to me and like talk to me i know that we would get along but i just can't but they just like can't hear me and it's like the most frustrating thing to know that you do a lot of similar things for different reasons but you still do similar things and you feel like similar like feelings and have similar problems, but they come out in completely different ways. And you just kind of wish that like, you could just take them aside and talk to them one-on-one and just wish that if they actually just like actually got to know you instead of kind of what they were projecting onto you, you would likely get along a lot better and you would actually get along period. And that's the, that's what Percy and Annabeth, Annabeth, Percy and Thalia remind me of is like him sitting there being like, yeah, I, I feel like if I could talk to Thalia about like the pressures of being like a big three kid and having all of this on our shoulders that we would probably get along really well. But also at this point, every time that he's tried a little bit, she's cut his head off. Yeah. So and take and taking like the God side over him. And so it's like there isn't really a point for me of trying because it doesn't it doesn't work out for me, but it's like this feeling of, I wish we could be friends, Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't think that we can because she, she just like, can't really do that for one reason or another. Like, I'm like, this isn't really a right, like, he's not like actually like trying to compete with her at all. (laughs) He just wants to get, he wants to like get along with her and understand why everybody likes her. He's not even trying necessarily to like compete with her for like the number one spot at camp or anything like that. Like he's not happy that everyone's going to her instead of him, of course, but he's not like really fighting with anyone over that either. He's just kind of letting it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I mean, our rivalries are never our own when it comes to the whole scapegoat and sibling um, scapegoat and golden child dynamic. Like, I, I think that that was the biggest realization for me with therapy and with like having my relationship with my brother Groove was just why am I compete like what am I competing with him against like we can be good at different things we can both have like our victories and they can be separate and equal and still good and it doesn't have to be against each other all the time not everything we have we do has to be a competition especially if we don't want it to be, you know, like it's one thing if we're challenging each other to be better people, but yeah. yeah. Like I did not know that I was entering a competition. Mm -hmm. I would like it to end now, please. Yeah, (laughs) That's very much that sort of feeling. Um, Yeah. And I mean, like on the scapegoat end, it's, 
you know, it, you're you're on the side of I was never put in this competition and I'm losing because the rules are rigged and the like the golden child experience is this victory feels very hollow and also it feels like there is constantly somebody at my heels so like I'm gonna lose it any second if I don't keep up the pace that I'm going now like this is like a random just like thing I don't know what to call it theory that I have about like golden child scapegoat stuff. Um, when it this is a very specific one when it comes to like moving, mm -hmm. um, because we moved like a lot um, growing up, like a, a lot. Like my mom didn't let us, um, didn't like made my dad not move us it, out of like the same school district once yeah. I was like nine. But I moved like three times before that, and. Um, we we're always moving to like a different place every couple of years and my sister still does <laughs> she lived in like she lived in one apartment for like five or six years um but like she just moved to the place she's living in now for the last like year or so and the last time i talked to my mom she was talking about moving again that she doesn't like um like the small town that she lives in and stuff which is understandable why she wouldn't like that but it also just feels like that sort of a thing of like I lived with my sister for like six years and we moved like every year and a half to like two years. I never wanted to move. Um, it was because she wanted to. And it is like that general idea of like, you can't, um, they're like almost like expecting something to happen where they finally do like find like the perfect place. Cause every place we move into, she thinks it's like the perfect place and she's so excited to live there. And then after like six months of living there, she doesn't she starts like picking apart everything about it and doesn't like it anymore and wants to leave and yeah. it's almost like that whole cycle of like keep convincing yourself like oh if i just move into this place everything is going to be as great as i want it to feel but it never actually does because you never get like the like emotional kind of validation from the things that you're trying to get it from and so you never reach like that that like feeling but like they keep you keep trying to do it so you keep just getting in this cycle of trying all these different things to try to get that instead of realizing like you did <laughs> that like nothing i do is ever going to make me get that so i'm just gonna stop now thanks <laughs> yeah and it, it'll be different things that make us feel that way like if i just get the right house if i just get into the right relationship mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I, I would say like that also was kind of a turning point for me where it was like, I'm really happy with the person that I'm with and this isn't an unhealthy relationship and we seem to be good together, but I'm depressed as fuck right now. What the hell is wrong? <laughs> and like that snapped something into me of like, oh shit, it was never going to be a fairy tale. Like you find Prince Charming and live happily ever after. What? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that really doesn't happen. <laughs> and, um, so yeah, like, I, I don't know why, like, that's the other thing that happens with that, like constantly moving and chasing, you know, this golden child expectation. Like we also have those own expectations of our life. <laughs> like it's eventually going to be perfect somehow, <laughs> some way. Somehow. And it just, and no life can ever be perfect. Like if social media teaches you anything, is that the people who say that their life is perfect are the most fucked up people beyond belief. So like, it's, yeah. it's never, it's never actually like that. And like, this kind of goes along with, um, Percy having his dream. Yes. Well, not a dream, a nightmare, like prophecy, whatever about Annabeth and Luke. And that was like one of the few things that happened in this book that I remembered that. Yeah. And it, when I look at, when I think about it now, the thing, the thing I thought of was, um, I wonder what they would have done if they would have taken Percy because they like ended up with Annabeth. And so they, uh, Luke used his like emotional abuse and like grooming her to get her to, you know, um, think that he was like some, how something that she could still save to get her trapped so she was holding up the sky so he could leave and do what he wanted. That was clearly like their plan was yeah. for Percy to do that, was for to have Percy be the one to hold it up and so that they could just run around and do whatever they want. 
And so, but Percy never ever in 7,000 years would have ever given in to Luke's manipulation. And like in the dream, like it shows that like he's like, Luke is like, Annabeth, help me. And like, leave, you can't leave me here. And Percy's like, leave him there. Like well, he's, he's trying to kill us so many times. He like, don't, don't save him. He's trying to trick you. He's like trying to yell at her, like through telekinesis or whatever, um, yeah. like telepathically, because he knows, he knows that, like he knows Luke enough now to know, like, he's not telling the truth. He's not actually a good person. He's just trying to use like the fact that you're a nice person and, and like to try to convince you to do this thing for him. But there's no, he would never be like, he would never get trapped in that. Like he would, he, like Luke could sit there and cry in front of him for a half hour and Percy would just be like, I hate you because. I, I don't know though, <laughs> because like, I mean, seeing it live in person is a different thing than dreaming it. Well, okay. Th I'm saying this from like my experience as being like the scapegoated one. Um, yeah. You see when you see through abusive people, it is done. Like it's okay. There's like no, there's like no, they can't pull the same stuff that they do on other people on you because you see through it all. And so that's like how I see like Percy where he immediately is like, don't trust Luke. He's lying to you. He's trying to trap you into something, even if he doesn't know what it is yet until, and he still doesn't even fully understand exactly what's going on with her. He just knows that something bad is happening to her yeah. and that's yeah. Luke's fault. But he like, once you kind of experience a sort of abuse and you realize that they're just a horrible abusive person there's no going back like um one of the things i think is funny now when it, in like the way that i can find any like anything funny from like my first 18 years of life is that my dad used to try to pull stuff like that on me when i was like a teenager and i would tell him to go fuck himself like literally go fuck yourself and from the time that i was 12 I would I that's how I was with him for the until he died like I, he could not pull any of that stuff on me he would pull that kind of stuff on my sister and my and my mom and be like oh but I'm so sad and I'd be like too fucking bad like literally that was how that would go like they would I would give in and talk to him because they would ask me to and so I would do it to like keep the peace but I could see through him the entire time I knew that he didn't he wasn't actually that sad and he didn't actually care and so like one of the things that would happen when I was a teenager is that he would try to, he would like talk about how sad he was that I wouldn't go see him on the weekends. And so then my sister would be like, you're a horrible daughter. <laughs> and, and thought that I was this horrible person because she actually believed his bullshit. And I would just sit there and look at her like, and say nothing in the exact sort of way that Percy doesn't say anything when people are like, Luke can still be saved. She just sits there and says nothing because it's like, there's, there's no point in like trying to talk to this person because they they don't get it and you can't make them get it. And so part of you almost doesn't want them to get it because you, they're like living in this much more like innocent world and you almost don't want to ruin it for them. But yeah. it's that sort of a thing of like, I don't think that anything Luke would have done would have ever gotten him to like give in because he like once somebody tries to murder you three times three times yeah three times in one year and they're not done yet <laughs> like they're that's it's done like you're you're done and so i like almost imagine like if they would have actually taken percy they would have had to like probably threaten him and being like if you don't do this we'll like attack camp or something like that or yeah. we'll hurt annabeth or something or Grover or somebody or your mom, they would have had to like threaten him like that to get him to do it because all of the manipulation games never would have worked with him, at least not with Luke. Maybe they would have used somebody else that he doesn't really know. Um, anyone else that he, he wouldn't know that would be on like their team. Maybe they would have done that to get him because he wouldn't know who that person was and would be just trying to help them. Sure, mm -hmm. but definitely not with Luke, but I appreciate Rick Riordan laying it out of like Annabeth is being is like kidnapped Annabeth is in danger and it's all Luke's fault. And I was like, thank you for putting it that like succinctly because people still need it to be put that simply yeah. about 
like, yeah, this is all Luke's fault. Just to like reiterate that whole idea, guys, that she's being tortured because of him. And so I don't care if he said that you're you're my family when he was when he was 12 or 15 or whatever. I don't care about that. Now he's 21 years old and he's using the fact that he knows that she cares about him to trap her into something so that she will be physically tortured for the next week. Yeah. Who cares what he thought about her when when she for when he first met her? It doesn't matter. Yeah, exactly. So, um what what the dream is is essentially um she sees Luke and he's holding up something big and dark. Percy can't tell what it is. Um, mm -hmm. And Luke tricks Annabeth into taking on the load onto her shoulders. And then he walks away from her and like walks away laughing. And so Percy wakes up, sits bolt, bolts upright, knows that it's a real dream, knows that this was probably shown to him for a reason to get him to want to go, but still is like, I want to do something. And um, so he wakes up. He tells Grover about it, and because Grover's been stalking the hunters, Grover is able to tell him, oh, Zoe had a dream last night, too. <laughs> oh, those two things are definitely somehow related. Um, and I think this is also when Grover, I can't remember if this happened already or not, but where Grover tells Percy that he found, um, that he found, like, one of the hunters, like, brochure things. Yes. And Annabeth's backpack, and he's like, you know how we thought it was weird that the hunters were there, and we were wondering if they were like following us. Well, I found this in her stuff, so now I know for sure that they were stalking us <laughs> because they were trying to get her to join, which is just so predatory. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah. Well, <laughs> I mean, so the implication is that Annabeth because her dad said he was gonna to move to California, that she wanted to join the hunters so she didn't have to move to California. But the hunters are kind of nomadic from my understanding, so she still wouldn't be situated in just New York anyway. No, and like, it also just feels like a very, I don't know how stuff with like Artemis works, obviously with like her powers. Rick doesn't go into it that much because she's never been like a super, like one of the gods that they spend a lot of time with at least so far um yeah. in the stories he's done so far she hasn't and so but it almost feels like she somehow knew that she was in this like vulnerable situation where she didn't want to move to california because mm -hmm. joining the hunters would solve like none of her problems actually the yeah. only thing that that would solve is that if she didn't want to move with her dad she like legally could not do could get out of that because she's not like a mortal child anymore and doesn't need to follow those rules that we have about kids under the age of 18. um yeah. but nothing else about joint they it would actually make things a lot harder like she still wouldn't be able to go to camp anymore the way that she was before she wouldn't be available the way to help other kids because she isn't like one of them anymore like literally everything else that she cares about wouldn't happen <laughs> anymore if she joined the hunters and but so it feels like artemis showed up and gave her like kind of like the manipulative sales pitch she gives all these girls to try to get them to join before they actually stop to think about what they're really doing that like this isn't actually going to solve any of my problems yeah. and like in this in this very strange situation her getting kidnapped stopped that from happening <laughs> in, like and i don't know if it would have ever actually happened um if she wasn't kidnapped like she obviously decides not to join anyway um mm -hmm. it does come up again at the end of this book like percy basically has a panic attack yeah when he's like thinking just thinking about her joining like literally <laughs> the description is like he can't breathe and he's like trying to talk and he can't talk because he's like freaking out so much that she ends up like consoling him because he's like freaking out about just about the idea of her joining and leaving him. Um, and she obviously doesn't, but like, yeah. And it's just that whole idea that like Artemis is like somehow following around like young girls that are in like situations and just like making them believe that joining her will somehow solve all of their problems when it actually 
you know, doesn't. Yeah, um, like the brochure. So the text that um, Rick says was on the brochure, a wise choice for your future, but like <laughs> no context as to why it's a wise choice. And then there, he says there were captions like health benefits, immortality and what it means for you. Like that's, that's all the description says for health benefits. Um, I mean, didn't they say that Bianca felt stronger? You could put that under health benefits. Yeah, Just like, Technically you're immortal. Like you can still die during battle, but you can't yeah. die any other like mortal way. But those weren't exactly pressing issues for 14 year old. They were in some way for 14 year old Annabeth. She doesn't want to die, but she can also die in battle the same exact way that she would have died as a demigod anyway. She's not exactly in like danger in any other time except when she's fighting monsters and they can f they can die when they're fighting monsters too yeah so it's like what are we doing here what, what's happening here um i did like it like i thought it made me like glad in the in like a petty way that zoe was so mad about the fact that they couldn't leave camp mm -hmm. and the exact moment that they wanted to and it's like oh you don't like it when other people like decide to like enforce their rules upon you that's something that you don't appreciate that's so interesting because you guys walk around acting like you can just do whatever you want and i like appreciated that chiron was like no you're not just gonna run off at three o'clock in the morning first off i'm not gonna wake up when you come barreling in to talk to me at 3 a.m just wait until the morning like everyone else does when they have a nightmare like this <laughs> and also like when even when he did when she did talk to him like you're not just gonna like run off like that. I'm not gonna let you just run off like that because he actually cares about what happens to them and doesn't want them to die. Yeah. Or like anything bad to happen to them. So instead he's like, what if we come up with a plan and she's all angry at him because they're so used to just doing whatever they want. Like that it's such like a small part, but it, I was just like, oh my God, that there's this one part when Percy's walking around camp and he sees Selena um arguing with one of the hunters um yeah. like the in the where all the horses and stuff are and he like is like i'm just gonna leave <laughs> um which was definitely a good idea but when they're about to start the the capture the flag fight like selena is like i'll show them they say that love doesn't matter and it's like did did a did a hunter literally come up to a child of aphrodite of all people and say that love doesn't matter and they're like so yeah. oh my god like the fact just the fact that they believe that that love doesn't matter that was like the point that i was trying to make is that like this is really messed up that she's teaching these young girls that like love is bad or that they yeah. don't feel love like the idea that all these people are immortal beings and they never feel love is so depressing that i was like like the one thing from the like dinner scene is Percy is like, oh, the hunters seem like a happy family. And I'm like, yeah, but they're not actually. <laughs> That's like the thing that I thought was really interesting is that from the outside, they look like everything is great and wonderful and everyone gets along. But it's like, how happy of a family can you be if you all know if you do a certain thing, you're going to be kicked out and it doesn't matter who you are, what you do, you're just going to be kicked out. Like if she finds out you did a certain thing, you're just done for no matter how many years you've been with her. And, it, and it's also a thing like that of like saying that love doesn't matter. Like I can't, I can't believe like, oh my God, it reminds me of like a lot of this stuff with Artemis reminds me weirdly of new age spirituality people like some new age spirituality people get like so caught up in those sort of beliefs that they think that because they don't have human emotions that they're like above other people that they've like ascended where they like don't feel like human emotions like you do like whenever some horrible tragedy happens in the news those people will be like making videos being like i knew that this would happen and i'm not sad about it and i'm not crying because i'm better than you and it's like no you are fucked up like there is something seriously wrong with you that you don't feel human emotions anymore. Like you're supposed to feel these things. And so like, there's a bunch of immortal, like teenagers, teenage girls running around the world in this, in this world convinced that because they have dissociated from their emotions so much, because the God that they're with tells them to do that, 
that they don't feel things anymore. They see that as a good thing. And, and it reminds me of me when I didn't go to therapy that I just like convinced myself that I was fine. Yeah. I, I don't remember most of my life <laughs> because I was dissociating so much. I was not fine at all. I was numb. Like I was super numb to like literally everything, but it also meant that the things that I liked were also, were, were also kind of numbed out. Um, like even things like this that I loved, I'm enjoying it a lot more now because I can actually feel everything now. Even if I get mad or I get sad and and things like that, at least I'm like feeling everything now. When when I read these books the last time, I felt things, but they were just like less because I couldn't. Because I most of those emotions were just like cut off from me. Yeah, um, and I I was just like, that's makes me sad. <laughs> Yeah. that she's like convincing young girls that they shouldn't feel love and also well, they, i, I do think love. that's supposed to be a nod to the hippolytus myth mm -hmm. um because that is the reason why hippolytus is a tragedy where um bad thing well we'll just say bad things happen to him i won't get into it but because he has dedicated himself to artemis and because he says he's never going to fall in love and so aphrodite takes it very personally that a mortal has said he's never going to fall in love, that she punishes him. And so I think that that was like Rick making a nod to that mythology. Um, mm -hmm. But it is kind of true that like, there is somewhat of a contention between these virgin goddesses and, um, and Aphrodite. I'm including Athena and I don't know, Hestia is just isn't talked about a lot, but we'll we'll just throw her in because she's one of the ones that swore her virginity. Um, but there is kind of like a a huge juxtaposition. I mean, it's the classic Madonna whore thing kind of going on. Um, so yeah, and um it's interesting that they baked it into an Aphrodite kid having that beef with them. Um, and not just her, but they mentioned that like all of the Aphrodite kids are suddenly so like gung ho to join capture the flag and Tali is having to help them get into their gear because they all have nails. Yeah, it's like a personal offense to yeah. them. And it would be a very personal offense to them to tell you that love and like beauty and all that kind of stuff doesn't matter. Um, yeah. My God, yeah, that would make them very upset. Um, so I, th I think we're up to the actual capture the flag fight stuff now we're yeah we're pretty much making our way there so um let's see the thing about that that i still think is funny in that like frustrating way is how like literally like earlier that day or the day before like the day before probably Thalia was like yeah we'll be like duo captains and then when it actually happens though no <laughs> and instead it's you have to do defense. And like, I think it's just funny because everything that Percy says in this scene is correct. Mm -hmm. Like, it doesn't make sense for him to play defense when the when he has the powers that he has. Um, mm -hmm. And especially because he's been at camp for years and knows everybody, like you said before. But also like, she has a giant shield with the head of Medusa on it. Yeah. If anybody should be playing defense, it should be her because that makes a lot of sense for her to do that not in a way and like i think that's like uh one of those like subtle like differences between the two of them that i think of is why sometimes people in like percy's own fandom is like no he just wanted like the wanted to win because he wanted like the attention and didn't like that nobody was like talking to him anymore and it's like no but like when you when he's saying these things it actually like makes sense like you have a giant shield with a head on it that like turns anyone into stone who gets close to you guys. And so you being defense around the flag would make more sense because you have that shield. He's not saying it because he just like wants her to not be involved. It's because it yeah. actually makes sense for her to play that role. But for her, it like makes no sense at all to make him play, to make him be in the back by the flag and just be watching everything and have no role like why would you have the most powerful kid at camp besides you yeah and, and like take them completely out of out of everything the only reason to do that is because you want to you want to be like the one that everybody you know you want to be the one that wins everything you want yeah. all the attention on you and it's 
and it's that that whole like back and forth thing i was talking about where like she was nice to him yesterday so almost like today she's like i have to like make up for that by making sure that i'm like the one that beats the hunters for the first time in like 55 tries and everybody like idolizes me because i was nice to him for 10 minutes <laughs> yeah so wait i'm i'm trying to find exactly who she put where um so i have um she did tell him that he's in charge of defense and percy is the one who grabbed nico charles beckendorf and the soul brothers um she had selena be the lead on the decoys and then somebody's named laurel and jason were um let's see were also decoy it looks like they were taking they were supposed to attract as many hunters as possible mm -hmm. She didn't have anybody with her, did she? Why no. did I think she had like somebody else with her? No, um, it yeah, was so just her. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now, now your anchor makes more sense. <laughs> yeah. It's literally just her, and I thought it, one moment that I thought is always very sweet with like baby Nico is how he's just like excited. Yeah. And Percy has to like bring him back down to earth, and it's like they can die though. Like this is technically battle and so if you hurt them bad enough they, they will actually die so and just like looking at little nico and being like did i look like that when i first got to camp and it's like yes you did yeah. <laughs> and just like realizing like yeah i probably did and this is really weird to be like the older person now remembering what it was like when i was the one the young one here for the first time and but he's actually giving you know the younger one helpful advice this time instead of telling him nothing and then setting him up as a decoy <laughs> like what happened to him in the first book um but yeah it's it's set up that way where she's literally the only one <laughs> yeah. and so when the battle starts going on and he can like watch it all from where they are and he can see that it's not going to work and he's like okay this it's not going to work there's too many of them there's too many hunters that are near her. She's never going to be able to grab the flag and get all the way back without them, you know, stopping her. Yeah. And so he's like, okay, I'm just going to like, like the, like the thing that they go back and forth with of her being like, follow the plan and him being like, unless the plan stops working. That's yeah. like, like the two sides of, of Poseidon and Zeus of like how they're different, but also very, very different in that way but is that's exactly how this stuff should go like every fight that percy's ever in the reason why he makes it through all of them is because he's flexible like that and mm -hmm. isn't like emboldened so much to his plan working he's like it probably won't work and we'll, we're gonna have to think of something else which is why he can get through these things um but that's just not an option for her she has to have like control because if somebody else is the hero then she doesn't get like the attention she actually wants which is yeah. like why she wants to do this like that's why she wants to be like the captain to win because she wants to be the one to come up with a plan that beats these hunters that's like the motivation percy's just doing it because it's camp and this is just what they do and he wants to help like the other campers and stuff like succeed um and and, and it's not about him and so when he runs to go get the other flag first off, i thought it was funny that they left bianca to guy to like guard the flag because she's the youngest baby one there and um i thought that it kind of showed the difference between like him and the hunters where when the hunters attack to try to get the flag they like shoot arrows at like little baby nico and the stole brothers where they have them like sticking out of their helmets and stuff and they're like knocked out on the ground but mm -hmm. he feels bad about doing that and so he just pushes her over and even yeah. feels bad about doing that and is yeah. like and is like running away being like i'm sorry and 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 like if he would have knocked her out she wouldn't have been able to like you know alert the other hunters that he had the flag and he, they probably would have won but because he's percy he's not going to do that <laughs> he's not going to like just hurt a 12 year old kid like that if he doesn't have to um and so I thought that was that was just like one of those little things that makes him like different. And it's like, yeah, he's not going to do that, even if it means that he's going to win. He's not willing to do that sort of thing. And um, but either way, like the, the 
either way, Thalia's plan was not going to work. He didn't yeah. go to like get the flag because he wanted like notoriety and like to be like seen as like number one again. He just did it because he was like, oh, we're gonna lose. And so I'm gonna try to grab this because I have like an opening. Nobody is over here because they're all trying to get her. And it okay. almost worked. Like he almost got there. Like um um Zoe had to like hit him with some arrow or something that knocked him to the ground and like right before he got there. And so it's not like it was like, you know, it's not like it was of like a blowout or anything. Like he almost got there. And yeah. he was just able to catch him at like the last second. And yeah. so, and so the after effects of this whole thing is ridiculous <laughs> when yeah. you look at like what actually happened here. And it's it's even before like the actual capture the flag stuff starts, when he's doing the whole thing of saying like, unless the plan doesn't work, then if it doesn't work, then you know, you know, do something else basically. Like if you see an like what he does, if you see an opening and you think it's gonna help us, just do that instead of just following the plan. She yeah. like maybe electrocutes him because she she's that angry about him just saying that. And he just like doesn't say anything about the fact that she was like mini electrocuting him um before the battle even started. But it's re absolutely absurd that she treats him the way that she does, that she electrocutes him on purpose. Mm -hmm. Like the first time she does it, she says it's an accident. Yeah. Um, but it's also just a thing of like, I think it's like absolutely fascinating that people, even like fans of this book series, think that Percy is the one that is more emotional, that his anger is more dangerous, that he's closer to becoming dark Percy, whatever that means. But Thalia electrocutes him twice on purpose because they lost a game and she knows that she's hurting him badly when she does it. And she is, her anger is so out of control because he didn't follow her plan. That is literally the only reason why she is angry is because she, he didn't follow her plan. That's mm -hmm. it. It's not even about losing. It's because she, he didn't follow, like if they would have lost and he would have just stayed in the spot he was in and, and like been knocked out with the rest of them, she probably would have been fine with him. She only cares that he didn't, she didn't do what he, like he didn't do what she said he should do. And so the idea that she is that angry at him, that she's so out of control with her anger that she accidentally electrocutes him. Yeah. It's yeah. like, you're a child of Zeus and you got so angry about this little thing that you electrocuted somebody. And somehow, and somehow people think that he's the one that's like on the edge that could possibly like join Luke. And it's like, I am quite sure that Thalia would join Luke way sooner than Percy would because she doesn't have like control over her emotions and she's still thinking too much about what she can get out of things. Yeah. It's, that was just like incredible to like reread that again and see how people talk about that scene in a way that is not real. Like that interview that I mentioned with like Walker Scobell, like he's talking, he has this really, I love that interview that he did for like Monster Donut, I think was the podcast name. And I love it because they go on this whole tangent about Thalia and he says a lot of really good stuff in there. Like that's when he says that like her, um, that her fatal flaw is control. Mm -hmm. Other th And other in really interesting things that he says that's right on that most people don't say. <laughs> so I was like, yeah. wow, it's like kind of cool that like this literal child understands this world so well that he's like saying this stuff that is definitely not what most people say. Like during the interview, he's saying like, I know this sounds weird. And I'm like, you're qualifying your statements because you know that other people don't agree with you. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he's in this, like in that interview, he's saying like, yeah, like per he's trying to say like, Percy would be willing to like lose if it meant that he was helping someone. Um, and Thalia is not willing to do that. She's not willing to lose if it, even if it means that she doesn't help somebody. And mm -hmm. the, and like the, the hosts of the podcast were saying that he, that that wasn't accurate for how the scene went. And I'm like, that pretty much is what happened though. Yeah. Like he, like the way that Walker said it was like, oh, he saw like somebody was in trouble. And so he left to go get the flag to go help them. 
and that's why they ended up losing. And I'm like, yeah, that's literally what happened. Mm -hmm. That's like, that's actually what happened. Why did you tell the child that he was wrong? Like he was right. <laughs> what is he wrong about? Yeah. Well, and I think it's worth saying that their plan, a combo of their plan would have been what was best. Um, like a combo of flexibility within like, let's station people in these different places. But Percy should have been picking where people were stationed, number one. And number two, if you have a team going after the flag, then it's a lot easier for one of them to be like, hey, I'm going to go run ahead. Can you stay back and like defend me? Um, you know, it would have worked out so much better had they joined forces. And that's like something I found with my brother is like the family bullshit is a lot easier to handle when we're on each other's team. And like after we have a family interaction, we can look at each other and just do like a wink wink, like what the fuck are they on right now? <laughs> like, yeah, like if if like they were actually were like in, be able to both be leaders like mm -hmm. Leah said she would do and then backtracked on if they were able to do that percy yeah. and thalia both being out there trying to get the flag would have split up the hunters because they wouldn't all been going for one person anymore both of them are, are equally as powerful when it comes to powers yeah. and so they would have been split up trying to figure out which one they should go after and and if he like grabbed the flag like he did and got there first and was like trying to run back to like their side, if they like started shooting him with arrows and stuff or started closing in on him like they did, he could have like passed it to her and yeah. she could have like run and like gotten to their side before Zoe got to their, got like, and won. And they would have won if they were actually working as like a team together where they were working in tandem like that, that easily could have happened even if like the same general thing happened where he got the flag first he could have easily just tossed it to her and everything would have been fine but because she was so angry that he changed her plan it didn't even it just didn't even occur to her in that moment to like be like like give it to me yeah because she was just so mad that he changed what he was doing that she could not she the thing with like the golden child stuff is that you're like supposed to be on the same team, but you're not like, mm -hmm. he's supposed to be like your teammate, but she looked at him as like an adversary. Yeah. So that stops you off automatically from a lot of things becoming it, everything would have been easier, not even with this one thing, but just overall, it would have been so much easier for both of them. If this didn't, if this sort of weird thing was going on. And it's not from, and this weird thing is happening and it's 100% from Thalia. Yeah. Like mm -hmm. Percy isn't doing anything. Like, yeah, he gets angry and throws water on her, but I'm like, can we compare? Like Thalia tries, electrocutes him like three times. Yeah. And is only stopped by the Oracle. Otherwise she, like, it would have kept going. Um, he throws water on her. What is water going to do to her besides get her clothes wet? That's the only thing that happens to her is now she's wet and she has to go change her clothes, but she was going to do that anyway. After mm -hmm. after the flag was over, he's not hurting her. He's just getting her clothes wet. It's annoying, like sure, mm -hmm. but he's not actually harming her in any way. He's being electrocuted. <laughs> like he talks about how he can smell his, his like, clothes well, yeah. burning because he was just electrocuted <laughs> like this is not like a, a like he could have done more to her he was just like mad and was just like what is wrong with you especially when she calls him his nickname that annabeth calls him call, she calls him seaweed brain yeah. and like coming from her is that's a that's a derogatory statement when she says him yes. when she says <laughs> She's saying it to like put him down and like make him feel bad about himself. And so, yeah, that's going to make him do that stuff to be angry at her. And it's like, honestly, after everything that happened with her so far, this is the only time that he's ever like snapped at her at all. And considering everything that's happened within the last like few chapters, that's not that bad. Like, yeah, like 
tearing his hut off like five different times and then taking the god side over him and then and then you know getting that angry at him during the fight where you're like mini electrocuting him before it even starts throwing some water on her is like not that bad and like yeah Chiron is like, oh my god, <laughs> everyone stop fighting. And it's like panicking because the two most powerful kids at camp are, are are like screaming at each other when they're supposed to be on the same team. Mm-hmm. But it, it's also like a thing of like, there's only so many times there's like, this happens to like every scapegoat ever, but there's only so many times that somebody can say like mean or rude things to you where you finally just like snap and like lose your fucking mind. Yeah. <laughs> and like, just like scream at them and throw stuff at them maybe <laughs> and then like immediate but the way that scapegoat stuff works is that immediately after that happens you beat yourself up for doing that and feel so guilty for doing it and tell yourself that you actually deserved it and that you never should have done that to them and that they were right about everything the whole time <laughs> that that's and the and then the golden child is sitting there like yep you're right it what i i was right the entire time yeah. <laughs> and that's basically how that continues but, Which he's already done once in this reading that we just did tonight because he told her I should have stayed with you at the dance and then she admitted, you know, I probably would have ran after the manticore and the kids too. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like that whole thing of you're just trying to, I guess the thing that happens with this sort of interaction in general is that as a scapegoat, you are like wanting to give the person the benefit of the doubt or like you want to think that they're not a bad person because yeah. you want to because you because you're aware that you you could get along if you could actually just get over like this weird stuff that's going on between you and so you don't want to think that they're you know doing this stuff on purpose or being as mean to the, to you as they actually are so you like go out of your way to try to make things work because you do actually want to get along with them yeah um, that's part of like why sometimes people in the golden child role pull the stuff that they do because they know that they can this chapter ends after that craziness <laughs> um, yeah so percy summons all the water he can and right before he's about to dump it on her the oracle comes out and chiron says you know like speak to whoever you're going to speak to and she speaks to zoe um so what um the oracle says is five shall go west to the goddess in chains which we know is artemis already because we find out that zoe had a dream of artemis where essentially it sounds like she's getting tortured in the way prometheus was tortured which is chained to a rock and an eagle was eating his liver which would regenerate every day so like um let's see and then one shall be lost in the land without rain The bane of Olympus shows the trail. Campers and hunters combined prevail. The Titan's curse must one withstand and one shall perish by a parent's hand. So um, we kind of can get from this, a group of five hunters or a group of five hunters and campers is going to have to go on this quest. Um, Sounds like somebody's gonna die. (laughs) It sounds like, I mean, we we already kind of got what the Titans curse one must withstand. Um, kind of already know what that is from Percy's dream, which I mean, we're gonna assume that people watching this have some familiarity. But uh, she's holding up the sky, and Atlas was at one point um, he was punished for his role in trying to overcome the Olympians by holding up the sky. So Annabeth is already withstanding the Titan's curse. So yeah, and that's the title of the book. (laughs) Yeah, and uh, I think we did skip that Percy tried to speak to the Oracle himself because he was so, like we mentioned it in passing, but um, one thing that I totally forgot about was Annabeth had kept a scarf from the journey that they went on in um, Lightning Thief where in the uh, amusement park, they find Aphrodite's scarf and she like took it away from him, but then it's put in that room and it's like as a memento and it talks about how they got it. And that was the big moment for them when their bond really got solidified. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's also a thing of like, it, you don't want somebody in the wild 
finding something of Aphrodite's and falling under one of her things. Yeah. But it's the thing of that, like, camp kept it all this time and, like, made, like, a little plaque of who, like, got it and when they got it and all this stuff. And he's like, why does anybody care where we got this scarf from? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think it's interesting. So the things that we know about the Oracle coming out is the Oracle has literally never come out of its room. And that, like, I don't know that we've ever had it speak to a non-camper. I mean, yeah, I don't Zoe's think as non-camper as it gets because we have to think she's at least a few hundred years old. Yeah, way older than that, actually. Yeah, um, she's super duper old. Uh, but yeah, it's and like I liked how like you know Chiron is saying like oh my god this has like never happened before, mm -hmm. and if he's saying that it means that it's like quite literally never happened in like thousands of years. Um, for the Oracle to leave. I almost like wondered, like, did Percy like annoyed enough to wake it up? <laughs> and even though it took like both of them having dreams for it to actually like get up and do something, but it was just like, I don't want to wait for you guys to, to like come talk to me. Um, yeah. so I'm gonna, I'm just gonna leave now. Well, yeah, and I don't know that it's ever called upon an on camper in this way that they would notice and Zoe. Mm -hmm. Zoe is such an interesting character. There's, yeah. there's just so much with her. She's one, she's like one of the hunters that I am a lot nicer to. Not only because I know like her background, but also um, because she does, she has actual good reason to not like um, heroes mm -hmm. and not like Percy at first. But she realizes that Percy is not like that at all. And yes. like, yeah, it does suck for the parts of this book when she does like kind of assume those sort of things about him and makes this stuff difficult because she just thinks that he's like this other hero that she dealt with. Um, but he's, but once she realizes that he's not, she's like, oh, you're actually a really nice person. And so she's one that actually realizes that and like drops all of the stuff. And so she's at least one that figures that stuff out mm -hmm. and finally realizes that they actually have more in common than, than she knows for most of the time. Like he figures it out or she, she tells him at the end of the book, but at least they figure that out at some point. And because I don't know if any of the other hunters <laughs> would ever do that of like yeah. ever that out and like admit like oh I was wrong about you like sorry about that you're not actually a horrible bad person just because you're a boy <laughs> yeah I... um well oh and I think we forgot to say this when we talked about the brochure the brochure confirms boy free um so I uh, yeah in this version at least Hunter Hunter ugh, Artemis would not be accepting of boy hunters even if they made the oath so that was also interesting to get confirmation of because like i was under the impression because of hippolytus and orion that like theoretically she could get along with guys mm -hmm. but i guess not i guess she's just been burned to one too many times and like i'll say it again i see her in cersei and um there was one other person who did it in the series so far, but like on the same level of it's coming from a good place of wanting to protect women and girlhood and um, wanting to protect it specifically from the men who would harm it, but not all men are evil. And I, I hate that I have to be the person saying that like right now, but um, if anybody is proof that not all men are like that, it's Percy. <laughs> like he is the one, you know, like, if it was man and bear and you knew the man was Percy, like, you're, no, I'm, I'm hanging out with Percy, right? Like, yeah, he's absolutely fine. There is nothing. That's like the whole thing about those like aggressive gender roles that is so harmful is that if you give it so much importance, then you're not like really looking at the person and not like every boy or a man is going to be like that. And not every woman is going to be 
nice to you either um mm -hmm. in that same way like that's one of the weird things about artemis is that she's so black and white about that that they just don't even that like complexity just doesn't even come up for them i guess but yeah. it, they like miss out on a lot of stuff because they are so, it's one of those things like if you're so sure that someone's going to be bad then you don't even give them a chance to actually get to know who they really are um mm -hmm. yeah and so they don't they don't ever get to really find out because even at like at the end of this book they're nicer ish to percy but it's also a thing of like they always kind of see him as being less than them yeah like he's just a boy like being a, like a gender or born with like a certain sex doesn't make you better or worse than anybody else. It just yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, the inherent problem with the hunters and with all of the hunters having to take the oath is that for some of them, it is celibacy. And for some of them, it is genuinely they do not feel romantic and sexual attraction. And the ones that it falls under celibacy, I mean, we talk about priesthood and Christianity a lot and how that's not a sustainable situation because look at some of the weird crap that priests do um, or that like religious officials in very, um, in very conservative groups do, you know? Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, like Artemis doesn't really get that like, just because she doesn't want to grow up and she wants to be a little girl playing her little hunting games forever doesn't mean every other little girl feels that way. Yeah, and it's also a thing of like, like a, I don't know, it's just, I guess it's like a thing with her that she has a shitty dad and so she's just like, all men are this way. Yeah. And, and just like never gives anyone else and a chance. Shitty brother. Her brother's yeah. a little, a little too much on the ladies. We'll just say it that way. <laughs> yeah. That's very much Apollo. Um, but yeah, and I like, I'm, I, I'm definitely someone that can understand why you might want to do that, but I also didn't do that. And so I know that that's not a good idea either, because I mean, if I was going to, if, if anyone alive was going to be like, all men are horrible. I'm never going to speak to them again. It would be me. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> with how my dad was but I didn't do that even when I when I was growing up I had a lot of friends that I made when I was in middle school and especially high school were boys or you know boys because we were like 15 16 or whatever most of the time I got along with them better than girls because girls just never liked me like even like the friends that I had there's I think there's a lot of like this is just like my own like theory but i think a lot of um people who have adhd and autism especially autism which which i'm autistic i think we have a really hard time with communication with like teenage girls especially because mm -hmm. all of it is like they say one thing to your face where they sound nice but they're not actually being nice and everything is super backhanded. Everything is like gossip and hidden secrets. And there's so much like subtext to it all. And when you have like a social disability, like autism, where you don't pick up at any of that stuff, like I picked up on some of that stuff because I was around people like that all the time at, at, at my house. Like my sister was like that with me, although I still had a hard time figuring that out all the time, but I was at least around people who exposed me to that and so i could sometimes tell when people were saying nice things but were not actually being nice but because of that i think it was so it's so much easier it was so much easier for me for a lot of like my early life until i was like in my mid-20s honestly to be friends with guys because guys were were generally more like upfront about everything yeah that, like, when i asked them a question they would just give me an answer they wouldn't i wouldn't have to sit there and try to figure out if they were telling me the truth or not they would just tell me what they think and i wouldn't have to figure have to figure it out and it was like so nice like that where they would just where i could just talk to them and they would talk to me and i wouldn't have to be going through this crazy social like craziness that i could never figure out um and so like that's why i get so frustrated by people who not just Artemis, but like anyone who is like very like 
men are always bad or men are always the the one in the wrong or whatever because it's not always true all the time because the friend group that I had when I was in like high school age and like early 20s the one that messed it all up was a girl mm -hmm. like he was a hundred percent the problem yeah. one thousand percent the problem she's caused every fight we ever had she's the reason why we stopped being friends people stopped talking to each other for like five years because of the situations that she created she wasn't happy about things in her life and she literally would just like pick fights with people and try to get us to fight with each other because she wasn't happy and just wanted to watch other people not be happy and like she was always the problem mm -hmm. and the guys in the group were like stressed out by all of this and we're always trying to get everybody to get along um and trying to like you know calm everybody down when that stuff would be happening and so it was like she was the 1000 percent the problem and yeah. when i look back at like my teenage years i just wish that none of us would have ever become friends with her because i probably would have had that friend group for a few years longer which would have been really nice because during those years my friends were the only reason why i like continued to like exist on a daily basis <laughs> and so having them not be around for a couple years was really hard and so it would have been a lot easier for me to get through life during those years if i had those people around and so it's like i just had so many experiences like that where the people in my life that were causing a lot of issues were girls while well, also my dad was always there but the boys that i was friends with were like the nice ones mm -hmm. so it's just you miss out on a lot of that stuff if you just think that boys are always bad and mean like yeah some of them are but also i never wanted to date anybody ever yeah and so i think that maybe that was why that was easier for me in high school because i never I never wanted to date any of the guys that I was friends with. Um, my mom used to ask me if I wanted to sometimes because people just kind of assume that, but I, I always told her no. And I never, and I wasn't lying. I never yeah. wanted to. I didn't need that. I didn't need to date them to feel like, you know, like connected or whatever to them. And so I think that a lot of times with teenagers, especially a lot of the issues between them happen because because of that stuff, because of dating, of girls reading into what guys are saying when you shouldn't. Kind of like how people read into neurodivergent people when you shouldn't. Yeah. Creates all sorts of miscommunication and, and thinking that somebody said one thing, but they really didn't mean it like that. And because they're like putting all this meaning onto it that isn't there. And, and yeah, sometimes teenage boys can be stupid, but also teenage girls can also be really stupid. <laughs> so teenagers in general. Yeah, it's like it goes both ways. So I think for me, it was easier because I never wanted to date anybody ever. And I didn't even want I didn't even like to be around people who were dating. Um, so which I granted is extreme, but still like I didn't. And so because of that, it was just I could just be friends with them. And there wasn't and they probably liked being friends with me because of that, because there wasn't any of that bullshit that usually like comes up with guys and girls being friends. Um, you said you wanted to talk about the like people that were yelling at me. <laughs> yes, yeah. So Artemis stuff. Okay, my stance from the beginning when like people started getting super pedantic in your comments was like, yeah, sure, maybe you could argue that she's not a romantic because like there are later myths where people try to put like, oh, you know, she like Calypso for or not Calypso, um, Callisto where um you know like zeus disguises himself as artemis and seduces a huntress and that's supposed to be evidence that she could have some sort of romantic feelings for the hunters <coughs> like and i could see that being an ancient thought process because of course in in male thought processes when there's no science or like social backings involved like penetration is the only thing that matters. I, I mean, to be crude, but like, I could see them being like, oh yeah, well, that doesn't really count because it's just girls. And um, I even had one of my friends, one of my mutuals on this app asking me like, are there any good like sapphic myths? There's not, because I don't think that that was taken as seriously at all. Mm -hmm. um, 
but it's all just so stupid to like have these arguments because one we're talking about this within the context of a fictional work percy jackson in which the author had to make certain choices um um mythology there are multiple versions of some of these myths some of these myths have artemis actually having a husband like in very very obscure ones and um like yeah that exists but rick riordan had to make a choice when he was writing this and his choice was we we're gonna go with she didn't ever want to get married she didn't ever want to have kids and she wants to be a little girl forever mm-hmm. and not only did he go with that but in this version she's anti-boy she like doesn't want any boys around her hunters because she's been burned one too many times with like these two just can't mix so i'm gonna overcorrect. Mm-hmm. and um like it's okay <laughs> like it's okay to for us to talk about the myth as it exists here as the mythology exists uh because like sexuality is such a nuanced topic and it always has been um sure they didn't have labels back then like they weren't saying bisexual asexual aromantic any of that bullshit they would just think you're weird if you didn't get married (laughs) you know like Mm -hmm. um that would just be it so um it's it's stupid to like i don't know and i feel like us describing the sexual experiences of these characters is not taking a moral stance on them like you were in no way saying it's wrong that she wants this you were saying it's wrong that she's grooming children into it who don't understand what it means yeah yeah like part of the frustration of people saying like mean things to me like saying that i'm transphobic (laughs) and stuff for bringing that up or like saying or some people kept saying like are you saying that rick riordan feels this way and i'm like no because part of writing a book is that you include characters that do things that you aren't okay with Mm -hmm. like that's and a lot of like the stuff i kept getting is people saying like oh um well, Rick Riordan writes things for like his protagonist. And so Artemis is, is his protagonist. So he's okay with what she's doing. And I'm like, Ar- Artemis is not the protagonist. Like this book is called Percy Jackson. That's <laughs> Percy. That's Percy on Pegasus. Yeah. He is the protagonist. And so like, she is not at all. She's uh, just a guest person basically in this world around him and so he is not happy with her and so you are open to then talking about why he's not because clearly not he doesn't pretend like he is he's very honest in his head with us reading his narration of how he feels about her even if he never says that stuff out loud very much and tries to like not show how much he doesn't like them Mm -hmm. that's when they take bianca away but just the one scene where he's trying to get bianca not to join them shows him how he feels about them and how scared he is of annabeth joining the hunters and things like that and so it was so weird to see people be like well she's the protagonist and i'm like no she's not like and so it kind of like boiled down to people being angry at me and calling me transphobic <laughs> because because I was bringing something up about a character that they want to like. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, this isn't my problem, though. Like, this is how she is written in this book series. Like, I understand being like emotionally connected to fictional characters and not wanting to like question those connections you have to those people, even years later like harry potter exists <laughs> like just to like start for both of us there's other things besides that like there are certain like books and things like that that i do not want to go back and read because i'm like i feel like i wouldn't like anybody anymore <laughs> yeah now that i've like now that i understand a lot more than i did when i read them the first time <laughs> and so it's like i totally get that but it's also a thing of like I'm not sure why the response is just yelling at me 
<laughs> because I'm the one that brings it up. Like this is a book series. We're supposed to talk about it, right? Yeah. And, it, and like, especially when it comes to like this book series, because it's obviously being made into a TV show. I'm like, like the, if we don't get Titans Curse, the TV show, I will like quit life because I'm like, we have to get it for the show because they would actually do it really, really well. And yeah. so at some point, most likely we're going to see like this book being adapted into a TV show in like a, a year or something. And so you're going to have to watch Artemis on screen. And the people who write, who will be like writing her dialogue and Rick Riordan for that matter, are not going to like make her seem nicer just because you have like an emotional connection to her. They're going to show her how she actually is. And yeah. so it would actually be a good idea for like you to figure this out now and figure out how you feel about this stuff now instead of getting mad at the tv show and saying that the show is bad and that they're not writing people right like the angry people on reddit do um, just because they're writing them correctly but you aren't like a 12 year old kid anymore and you're not and you don't want to change your the opinion you had on this character that you had when you read these these books for the first time in sixth grade like part of a good book at all is that as you get older when you go back to read it you get like more things from it yeah. And, it, and it grows and changes and that's like the fun of all of this i don't know i just don't know what to do with any of that stuff because i don't know how to handle people being so mean um yeah. i don't know this is just like my own like perception of me obviously and that can be very warped um but i feel like people think that i'm like tougher than i actually am and that's just like a general thing that i've got in life overall is that people will, will like talk to me as if I think that I'm better or smarter than them or that I'm like trying to fight them like mm -hmm. the way that I just talk just like makes them feel like that and I don't know why that happens um all the time like I try to be direct with people because I don't want people to misinterpret what I'm trying to say and so I try to be as like obvious as possible so that people understand because so many times in life I've tried to explain things to people and they don't get what I'm trying to say. Okay. And so the only way I know how to be as clear as possible where they where they do understand me is just to be more blunt so that they understand. But I think because I am blunt, they they see it as almost like a threat of some kind or something. Um, yeah. or that they're that I'm trying to challenge them somehow. And I'm not. And so then people just start yelling at me. <laughs> And I'm and I'm like reading these comments, like fi like being like, why do I do this to myself? <laughs> like, why why am I putting myself out there just to have people yell at me? And it also gets it just confuses me because the times when you like you get involved, like you make videos about that one guy <laughs> that was being very pedantic this week, and as soon as you like start saying things, he just talks to you in a totally different way. Yeah, and I'm yeah. like, why are you being rude as fuck to me? <laughs> but to like my best friend that does this with me, you're like respect to more respectful to her. But with me, you're like, you're a bad, ugly person. <laughs> I'm like, oh my God. Yeah. Why? I don't I don't know what to do about that. But it's just is like something that always that uh comes up sometimes. Is like I feel like yeah. people think that I'm like this strong, like tough person or that I'm trying to start fights or something. And I'm like, no, I'm just talking. It's the placement. It's, it's, yeah. it's the placement. So, um, Shannon has an Aquarius sun and an Aries moon. And so, the Aquarius sun, for some reason, certain Aquariuses, I swear, when you guys have the right information and you say it just bluntly, it automatically puts people on the defense. It's like, <laughs> that's why people will say the God complex thing about Aquariuses, in my opinion. It's because they don't like that you're right. <laughs> and, they don't like the way that you're saying it. And mm -hmm. I've made it a point, like I'm not gonna tone please anybody in my life if they're actually right. Because if I'm feeling something, then maybe that's actually what I'm supposed to be feeling to actually take a beat and like stop and think about what you're saying. That's that's how I've checked myself with this. Yeah, and it's, it's also a thing of like, even if I was wrong or something, mm -hmm. um, leaving somebody like, 30 comments in like one day yeah. is not the correct thing to do even if they are wrong mm -hmm. like you really are so upset 
about me just like bringing up what Artemis literally says in the book. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm just, we're just reading literally out of the book and what she says she believes in. If you're that upset about that because you want to believe that Artemis would let trans people in, even though she wouldn't, like she wouldn't let trans men in, um, like there's no way that she would. If you don't like that, then like why respond to me? Yeah, she wouldn't let trans men or women in. And it's like the whole idea that like the idea that I'm even saying anything negative about this person fake person you like at all is like I like I get the idea of feeling like that about people like I feel I think that it's really funny when people critique Percy because I take it like a personal attack <laughs> because I'm so similar to him yeah. <laughs> that I feel like they're talking about me but I also have like learned enough to know they're not actually talking about me though and so it's better for me to not respond to like get in that trap with those people because I'm gonna feel like really emotional about everything they're saying because it is I get that's also part of the thing with me is that literally every single thing I ever say is based on like a very personal thing that I've experienced in my life so it's one of those things that I like I feel like people can like tell that yeah. I know that I'm not wrong and there there's nothing that they can say to like convince me that I'm wrong about this stuff usually because it's from real life like experience final thoughts so number one is i also had a problem with seeing artemis this way and you can post screenshots of our chat log if you want when you put this up on youtube but i was like wait a second wait i don't want to think Artem of artemis this way and you know me i like make my joke because of the trojan war like i'm not gonna say who my favorite god or goddess is but i have always liked artemis and i will say that and so it was hard for me at first when we started having these discussions to be like, actually, no, when I'm looking at the fact, when I'm looking at the story, this is what is actually happening. When I go back to the myths that Rick Riordan is drawing from for this story, this is what is happening. And it actually is there. It's not made up. It's not in your head, you know, like, um, so it's it's hard it really is hard because she is one of those goddesses that like is very likable for some reason i mean athena also is as well and we've talked our crap about athena already but yeah. um it's it's one of those things where like the greek gods the reason they're so much fun is because they're not perfect it's like i always think back to this one lecture i had with a professor when we were reading the iliad where he was like this is why I will believe this over the Bible every day, because these gods are petty. They are teenagers that just <laughs> want what they want and do whatever they want for no reason. And that makes more sense than this God saying he's good and all benevolent, but then messing with people. Um, you know, at least these ones are honest about it. Yeah. And um, I'm all pretending to be like, yeah, people. <laughs> And um, number two, like just with the whole people bugging you over bugging me thing, I am a higher masking person than you. I, like we don't explicitly ever say these things on this podcast because we don't like to play the, um, you know, that kind of game. But um, I mask higher. And so because I somewhat put things in a way that packages it easier for people, they don't argue with me in the same way as you. And it bugs me because it, it feels ableist, even though I, it's like, you know, you don't need to shove in somebody's face every time. Like you are talking to somebody that is autistic, by the way, <laughs> like, I don't feel the need to do that. But at the same time, it's almost like, do you guys not realize she's just not bullshitting? And that's why you don't like it. <laughs> yeah, like I could, I guess, but I just, I've never seen the point of doing that. It like, it feels like wasting time to me. To yeah. do that because I'm like, I'd rather just you get what I'm trying to say. Even if you don't agree with me, that's fine. But like, I like having discussions with people. Like when we were talking about Artemis and stuff, that stuff was fine because, and it was fun. It's fun to talk to people, even if they don't necessarily agree with you when there's like respect involved and they're not going to like bite your head off just because they're not agreeing. And so I just think it's easier to just say what I'm actually thinking especially because most of the time when I'm talking to people, I, I don't understand what they're trying to like say a lot of the time. Like that's the whole autism thing with like 
the social disability stuff comes up so much with that kind of thing where I can tell that they're trying to say something and they want me to respond a certain way, but I can't figure out what it is. And it like becomes such a stressful thing that I just don't even like talking to people that much because that happens so much. And so I would rather just be honest about everything and just say what I want to say so that no one else has to try to figure that out with me. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know how else to do that. Like, I don't want to change that about me because that feels too hard at this point because I just don't know how else to communicate. Um, yeah. Just being like really honest about everything. And like, if people get angry at me, okay, I guess I'm just gonna, the thing that's hard about all this stuff is that I know that a lot of the people getting upset at me are like younger people. Mm -hmm. I don't want to ever, I don't like blocking people because especially if I think that they're younger, because I know that there's a chance that they'll like calm down and they might like change their minds because I do that. And that's like, like the years, especially before I went to therapy. And even when I first started, I would do stuff like that. But then I would calm down afterwards and realize that I was wrong about something or that they had a point. And I would like go back and relook at what they said and what I said, and I would understand where they were coming from after I calmed down. And so because I used to do that, and I still do that every once in a while too, now I want to give people the chance to like calm down and at least understand where I was coming from, even if they don't agree with me anymore. And so I feel like those interactions go on much longer because I don't want to just cut them off like that. Yeah. Uh, I would give them like a chance to like learn and like actually understand what I was saying. Um, but I think at this point, if it's going to get that out of control, I should just, I should just block them because I don't, nobody wants to deal with that. Yeah. Um, at that, that point, people would... want to be mad. And that person really just wanted to be mad. And like people like you and other like friends on that I've made on here see that stuff and then, and then you guys get upset and you're like, what the fuck? And I'm like, I'm yeah. like this is like uh, our like regular, the regular viewer that like, that we have that can't go, like watch as much. Um, Isa, she's great. She lives in Brazil. And so she's like two hours ahead of me. So she has to go to bed now when we do these later. But oh. she like messaged me the other day and was like, are you and Mandy okay? Like, what's going on with that guy in, your, in both of your comment section? Why won't he leave you alone? Oh. <laughs> She's, like, very sweet. She's the one that was, like, excited whenever I leave the house. <laughs> yeah. She knows enough about me to know that I don't leave the house very much. And so, like, people like that were, like, responding or, like, sending me messages being like, are you okay? And I was like, okay, I just need to block these people, I guess. Because yeah. otherwise, I don't know, because that stuff is just going to keep coming up. When we're yeah, reading. We've, for next week we're reading chapter seven and eight chapter seven is everybody hates me but the whore so is chapter eight called um uh, where does it start okay um chapter eight is called i made a dangerous promise so oh god <laughs> yeah I know what both of those things are so that should be really interesting there's a lot just with those two to talk about yeah all right, so we will see you guys next week for chapters seven and eight of Titan's Curse. <laughs>